Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom. Last week, we talked about the ancient city, how in the ancient world, cities were religious institutions um, with localized gods. And in that context, God speaks to Abraham and says he will show him a city. And we talked a little bit about how the word city implies community. Um, in the ancient world, it was common religion, but what else is wrapped up in this idea of a city? Proximity. Proximity. That's kind of a, a weird one nowadays. Like I feel like I have to travel so far to get to the other side of DC, but DC is a swamp. Maybe it's not a real city. In a time of social dis distancing, proximity shows itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We all feel it a lot more acutely. I've talked to my neighbors in the past couple of weeks. Wow. I hadn't talked to them before. <laughs> we haven't got that desperate yet. But we, live, <laughs> but we live in California, so, you know, there's that. Now, the, the question of what constitutes a city is an old one, one that I ask my students oftentimes, and I probably will ask you all once upon a time or not. So why don't you start, you, you started with proximity and a common religion. What other things constitute a city now and then well along with religion is culture mm -hmm. what do you what do you think of when you think of culture language arts mm -hmm. and language arts but separately <laughs> or together books literature poetry books. Mm. yeah common defense i feel like your mm -hmm. interests are bound up together militarily and economically in a lot of ways government Common government, which means common laws. We're all on board with these are the laws of this land, this city, this place. Uh, we're not going to let ourselves be torn apart because one part wants law A and the other part wants not law A. <laughs> this is something in America that we have a lot of trouble with. We, we have trouble seeing ourselves as one nation because there is such a um, diversity of opinion as to what constitutes right and wrong. And what constitutes law and what law should be rooted in. Uh, going back to Abram, God didn't actually say, I'll show you a city, as far as we know, he may have. Because for the first time we run, we run into that concept is in Hebrews 11. We're told this, by faith Abram, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which, which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. If you go back and read the promise, it's come into the sign I will show you, I'll make of you a great nation, and in you and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. You can see the hints there of community of law a nation a people uh, i remember sitting in chapel as a small child I'm, i couldn't have been much more than third or fourth grade and our uh, headmaster slash pastor preaching from this passage in hebrews and and reading the line about he look for a city which hath foundations he didn't explain it at the time and my mind started swirling i knew just enough about the language of scripture to say, wait, Christ is our foundation, and he looked for a city which has foundations. Is there something there? Mm. I don't know. I don't know. And I and I spent probably the next 20 years waiting for someone to actually say what what's going on here. <laughs> no to parents, explain the Bible to your children and do not assume on the one hand that they're too stupid to understand, or um, on the other, that um, they have no questions. Sometimes they just don't know what to ask and don't know that you'll answer them. And cultivating curiosity is good. <clears throat> cultivating curiosity, good, good words. He looked for a city, not in the sense that he expected there to be a city over the next rise, around the next mountain. He was looking for, and apparently the I just found out the Greek bears this sense, looking for, looking ahead to, expecting, mm -hmm. looking forward in time into the future for this city. He knew that, like us, he had no abiding city in this world, but he looked for one to come. And 
Yet having said that, and then that's one half of the tension of the Christian life, this world's not our home, we're poor, wayfaring strangers, traveling through this world of all and all that. But there's also the strain of thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is mm -hmm. in heaven. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It would be easy for Abram to have practiced complete social distancing <laughs> and just gone taking himself and his wife out in the middle of nowhere. I, Speaking of childhood and Bible classes, I remember this was fourth grade, so it may have been about the same time. My Bible teacher, nice lady, trying to explain Abram and Sarah. And I don't know what we were talking about. All I remember is a visual image. And it was of this small tent, slightly bigger than a pup tent. And there was this donkey parked outside and maybe a cow or a goat to one side. And there was Sarah inside and Abram bustling around and maybe a servant or two someplace in the background. That was what I conceived of from what people said. It was all about their Sarah and Abram. Or Sarah and Abram, Sarah and Abraham. And, and, and I missed a lot. And that part that I missed is relevant to understanding this concept, well, what some theologians have said, the, the now and the not yet. Uh, a kingdom that is present and that is coming and that will one day come in all this eschatological, eschatological glory. I am thinking here of a couple passages in Genesis when we first meet Abram. You remember that Lot was um, kidnapped, uh, taken captive in war mm -hmm. by the Mesopotamian kings. And when word reached Abram, we're, we're told that this is chapter 14 of Genesis, verse 14. When Abram heard that his brother, that is Lot, was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And then we have an account of his victory over, um, what were there, seven kings, I think? Here, here's Abram, and he gets word, your nephew's been captured, and immediately he whistles up 318 militarily trained slaves, servants. And the writer uses a new expression, born in his own house, or homeborn slaves. The, the homeborn slave in Hebrew culture was a servant slave who had come to the point where he could be free. He could have earned, paid for his own freedom. But he loves his master so much and has found just the proper niche in his, his master's household that he wants to stay a member of the household. And if the master is agreeable, then in the presence of whatever civil authorities that might be, they take the, the servant to the, the threshold or the doorpost of the master's home or tent, and they bore a hole through his earlobe into the tent door. And then he wears a gold earring the rest of his life. Uh, his ear has been circumcised. He wears a chain in the ear, testifying that he will no longer need chains along around the feet or the hands. His ear is chained to his master's voice. The psalmist prophesying of Christ says, My ears you have opened, my ears you have circumcised. I come to do your will, O Lord. So it was an honorable position uh, in the Old Covenant. And it was voluntary. No one had to do this. You, when you get to the point where you could be emancipated, you could just walk off and do your thing. But Abram had 318 of these guys who so respected Abraham, so loved his household and his family and the faith he proclaimed. They didn't want to go anyplace. And he trusted them so much, he taught them how to bear arms and how to use them effectively as a military strike force. So that when word comes that Lot's in trouble, he just whistles up these guys in there. Yes, sir, boss, what are you going to do? Who should we take out now? And 318 men. Well, men in that culture generally are married. And they usually have a couple children at least. When you start adding up the numbers, you very quickly get into the thousands. Which was not my vision of Abraham at all as a small <laughs> child or even as an adult many years later. Mm -hmm. I mean, you watch. You watch Bible movies on TV, right? <laughs> it's kind of like watching any of the movies of the Exodus where you have your 200 or 300 extras walking across the desert. You think, <laughs> wow, what a huge Exodus, not realizing there were more like 3 million of them. <laughs> uh, one of the great harms of Bible movies. But what we're, what we're seeing is that Abram was already busy living a godly life before a watching world. 
And by his virtue, by the public worship that he led in his own family, he led an awful lot of people to share his vision. He was already building in the suburbs of the city of God, even though its true manifestation waited at least the coming of Christ and ultimately the second coming of Christ. That did not deter him from establishing a social religious community with culture and laws and taxes and boundaries and, of course, above all, the common God they all worshipped and served. There's also another verse just a little bit before that in chapter 12. Um, we're told that, um, and I lost it, Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substances that they, got, that they gathered, and the souls that they'd gotten in Haran. These apparently are not slaves or servants. These are people that, that, that during that little time where they were waiting for uh, Abram's father to die, other people joined themselves to Abram and said, we want to go with you too, wherever you're going. And so he had these people, he had his servants who became converts. Also, we find out that some of the sheiks round about him became his allies and vowed allegiance, which is kind of difficult unless you worship the same God. <laughs> so Abraham was actually a very great evangelist. We don't know to what degree he stood up and preached. We know he offered sacrifices wherever he went. He built altars, proclaimed the word of the Lord such as he knew it, told people of the promise and the blessing, pointed them out what was coming. And when we get to the writer of Hebrews, he says, yeah, he was looking for the city. So whether Abraham ever used those words or not, it's certainly implicit in everything he was pointing out. He was pointing out a different kingdom, a different way, a different lifestyle, but not an individualistic one, one that was a community. We speak of the communion of the saints, and it's one of the articles of the Apostles' Creed as something necessary to our mm -hmm. salvation. Mm -hmm. So this is what I'd like to talk about some more, and I've been talking here for a while. So what, uh, <laughs> what ideas and thoughts have come to your minds as I've been rambling here for a bit? Well, since we talked about the homeborn slaves and are in Hebrews, I wanted to point us to Hebrews 10, uh, mm -hmm. where we see the fulfillment of the psalmist song, that an ear you have dug for me. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says that that is fulfilled in Christ, in his righteousness, that he is the perfect servant of God. Yeah, the homeborn slave was something that belonged to the older covenant, and then it's fulfilled in Christ. But as, as we are Christ ones, Christians, we too are the servants of God, but we too are sons of God. Uh, we didn't have to go through some, some kind of apprentice process for years and years and somehow earn some kind of right. We have that in Christ, who was God's perfect homeborn slave, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That Jesus was for a little time made lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Now he's crowned with glory and honor and we in him. And so... That particular function, ritual, is gone, but it points us to, it shows us how that society lived then, and it points us to uh, what we have in Christ and to what Christ accomplished, his ears being dug out, circumcised, mm -hmm. his ears opened to the law of God, to the word of his Father. I have two observations. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is, I think he specifically said that the ring that went into this homeborn slave's uh, ear was one of gold. Mm -hmm. It's it is something valuable, and it is it is not iron like the irons of a manacle. Yes, it is it is something pure that has had the dross refined from it, which mm -hmm. of course is an image we see all throughout uh, scripture. And the second is there's so I use the ESV in my personal study and my, my church uses it as well. And there was a bit of a kerfuffle in the last couple of weeks to bring something modern times to it, where <laughs> people were debating the translation of uh, the word that in, in, in some translation is, is rendered slave and in others is rendered servant and others is bond servant in the new Testament. However, if we import this meaning from the Old Testament in Abram's household and understand that a homeborn slave is one by choice, mm -hmm. then the connotation with modern American ears against the word slave is somewhat mitigated 
essentially what the argument was coming down to was, well, if you say servant, then it's it seems like it's more of a contractual op, like negotiation right. and, and doesn't denote Christ's lordship. But if you say slave, then it it's like you're saying we're not willing to be here. <laughs> However, with this, you can see that the accuracies of uh, of both are united and the inaccuracies are getting gotten rid of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We are the, we are the victims of our own linguistic history. <laughs> uh, servant in our culture means one thing, and slave means something very different. And either one you pick, you are going to have to do lots of explaining <laughs> lots to of make things very to make things very clear. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, in fact, in uh, later on in the Mosaic Law, there are a number of different kinds of slavery. The words mm-hmm. the word is used pretty much consistently through. You could be. A servant for seven years, for up to 49 years. You could be a homeborn slave. You could be a foreign slave who's not released in the Jubilee. And each of these comes with its own descriptions and restrictions. But in no case was any slave, strictly speaking, the property of any other man. It's the property mm-hmm. of God. <laughs> and therefore, God's law set parameters on all of these different kind of relationships. And the Bible does use pretty much the same words for all of them, but you have to look at context to understand what's going on and what's meant. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's, it was not a world of equality, nor is ours. But that's far from saying that I get to own you, particularly because you are some kind of disposable person who is not worthy of my love and interest. Mm. So that's something we may talk about. I, we kind of got sidetracked into slavery, but perhaps it's a good thing that we talk about it because in that world, there were slaves, there were servants, there was social hierarchy. Ever since the um, the Enlightenment, we've been trying to dispose of that, make everybody equal in every sense. But there's a problem. Equality means interchangeability. One plus one is two because one and one can be substituted in for two without anyone noticing. Try that on the human level with anybody or anything. <laughs> you got some real problems. Yeah. You really want your spouse or your child substituted for another child because, or spouse, well, it doesn't really matter, does it? Because everyone's equal. So whether I substitute in a child or a spouse for this other person in my life doesn't matter because everything's equal. And we're getting there with this whole gender confusion thing. Which is why equality is something that, that has to be bounded by a scriptural understanding of human nature. Yeah. <laughs> And of God, of God's order, of what God means by so. God doesn't exactly tell us we're equal, but he speaks of us as truly being his, and we're all the image of God. But to say that that means that we are therefore equal in any particular sense, it begins to, to create difficulties really, really fast. Sometimes we just, we want to use the language everybody else is using. And then we do, and then realize, wait, it's sort of like the slave-servant thing. This language doesn't fit <laughs> unless you do a lot of redefining. And by the time you're done redefining, we forget where we even started. Mm-hmm. I've, I've had conversations with my class about the whole the whole subject of equality. What, what in the world do you mean by it? Well, we're all in the image of God. Okay, if that's all it means, that's great. But are we all in the image of God in exactly the same way? What do the confessions say about the image of God? Knowledge, righteousness, and True holiness, dominion. Okay, do you know what I know? Do I know what you know? Do we know what she knows? Uh, are we as holy as she is? Is she as holy as you are in this particular area? How about dominion? Who's the most responsible one in the room? I will not claim it's me by any means. <laughs> so we're already dealing with all kinds of inequalities and variations within the image of God, which is what we should expect when an infinite God reflects himself into a billion different um sparkling fragments it's none of them are going to be exactly alike but they can all be good and valuable mm-hmm. and that he says with sleight of hand brings us back to this idea of a city <laughs> why a city anyway isn't a city just a, a place full of units um, mm. in, of uh, uniform individuals of people who are all just alike? anyone remember the the scene in um Oh, Madeline Ingle's book. Um, yes, I was just thinking of that. Where in wrinkle children, in time. Wrinkle in time. The children all come out at the same time, bounce mm-hmm. the, all the way down the street. Balls are bouncing back and forth at the same rate because we're all exactly alike, apparently. It's fr- and we look at that. We don't, we don't need anyone to say, hey, you know, this is supposed to be horrific and frightening. We, <laughs> we just see these is. little yeah. children <laughs> bouncing the balls in rhythm, and it horrifies us because that's not how children are, and that's not how the world should be. Uh, a city is a place of differences, of differences that coalesce into something beautiful. And here you could 
we've mentioned literature, poetry, and such. You can include music and all kinds of wonderful things. Hey, um, complete sidetrack, but it's not. In our <laughs> in our enforced isolation, have either of you discovered any new food foods that you had not previously uh, come across that you just think this is the greatest thing ever? No? Yes, actually. <laughs> um, but well, yeah, I have. So d despite the fact that I love lamb, I had never actually made it myself. Mm. And so I, we found a, a leg of lamb at the store on one of our trips, uh, essential trips, mind you. Because mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that's all we make, being so <laughs> Christians. Uh, it was actually an essential trip, though. And I found, I found a recipe for it, and I cooked it, and it was really, really good. So the, this this kind of new discovery of, of something I'd never made before. Everything else had been either ground lamb or some some kind of loin. I, I don't even know what it was really. It was, <laughs> in, it was at a Mongolian barbecue place. So it's just like, mm. here's lamb and here's beef. Uh, <laughs> doesn't tell you quite what, what you're getting. Yeah. I've also been discovering new food because I'm actually home to cook. I don't oh. have anywhere else to be. <laughs> <laughs> nice. What, what wonderful new thing have you cooked? Um, we had a pork loin tonight and we made homemade pizzas last mm. week or the week before. It was memorable. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did homemade pizzas last night and the girls also, my, my oldest and youngest are the ones who really enjoy cooking things that they've never done before. Just looking up some, they, they go through three or four or five different recipes on online sources. And then they come up with something that's a hodgepodge and they make it. <laughs> nice. And they're not afraid to make it. And it, you know, 99 times out of 100, it's really good. Sometimes it's just fantastic. They made some kind of flourless cake. And and to me, that already sounds bad, but it wasn't. It was, <laughs> it was, um, it was almost when it was came out of the oven hot. It was almost like a pudding kind of cake. Ooh. It was very moist and very chocolatey and very wonderful. But I, I bring this up to point out that one of the wonderful things about a city is we don't. It, it's not an army camp where everybody is served exactly the <laughs> same meals every single day, or for that minute, matter, a university dormitory system where we all go to the student union, the cafeteria, and have the same food every Thursday, and then the other thing this every Wednesday. <laughs> Thank Taco you. Tuesday again. Yeah, there's this room for creativity and diversity because in God's city, uh, where the rainbow is a real theme, the jeweled stones that make up its foundation, the garden that fills it, diversity and, beautiful are, and beauty are important things. They're mm -hmm. not side issues. But they go out of the very fact of our inequalities. Oh, and here is the point that we reference C.S. Lewis's uh, essay, Membership, in his collection of essays, The Weight of Glory. Mm -hmm. If you've never seen it, if you've never read it, you really need to. Because when we think of members in the, he in the 20th, we in the 21st century now, we think of members of a club or members of a team. And he's like, oh, well, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight members. Now think of a body that way. Your body has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten members. Wait, but there's the nose, and then there's the two ears, there's the mouth, there's the arms, the fingers, fingernails, the elbow. These are different. These are saying they're members is not saying they're alike. It's saying they are by definition very, very different. It's in their interaction and cooperation that we see the unity. Mm -hmm. We see how they work together. But as Paul says, if the whole body were a nose, That'd be really scary for one thing, <laughs> <laughs> and rather gross, especially if the nose ever gets a cold, having yeah. no hands. Um, <laughs> oh, man, that's an image I didn't need. <laughs> we should really talk about community here on Earth and in this present life and why it is not in opposition to the heavenly city. It's odd that there are people who kind of think it is, that any tie, any... Uh, attempt to anticipate the new Jerusalem is itself an act of unbelief because, well, God's going to create that. God's going to bring that about. Yeah, my we, citizenship is in heaven. My citizenship is yeah. in heaven, and we wait for the new Jerusalem to descend. And if I try to do anything in that direction, uh, I, I'm actually be making myself an enemy of the gospel because God has to do all of that. Well, ha, ha, does the word missionary mean anything <laughs> in this context? 
uh, are we not told to go win souls to Christ, to win people to Christ? In fact, to disciple nations to Christ? How is this, if this is, rather than trying to defend this, let's just start there. Jesus said, do this before he left. It's like parting instructions to his guys, to the apostles, to the church. Go make disciples of all nations. If that's our given, then let's let's bring everything in into line with that. God does want us to begin producing this thing we call community rooted in Christ, not only rooted in Christ, but existing in Christ, existing in the Holy Spirit as he's breathed from Father to Son and Son to Father, the very heart of the Godhead. This is what God is making, and the fact that he's not done yet, and that it's not perfected yet, and won't be in our lifetime, and maybe not in the next few millennia for all we know, doesn't mean that we somehow are failing God or being treacherous toward God. It means quite the opposite. God actually needs people to make up the city. <laughs> because the city in the long run is not skyscrapers and parks and museums and department stores. Anyone remember those? <laughs> um, it It is the people living out their lives in community and service to one another. So there's got to be people. You got to have people. And the way that God has ordained to have people is by the preaching of the gospel. And Abraham did this. We're not told what all he did. We know that every place he went, he set up public worship, he set up altars. We know that he had the respect of other people in his profession, because when he said, hey, I need some military support, they said, we're with you, man. <laughs> uh, he had a reputation for godliness and wisdom and, and virtue and being a good businessman and someone who knew what he was doing. So we, we have at least that. But when we come to to Christ's ascension into his into the Great Commission, we, we have very specific instructions. Here is a message. It's as old as time, but it needs to be pressed now with much greater urgency, not just here at home, not just in your families, but to the four corners of the earth. Get a move on, guys. Get going. And and so we we should not see any conflict between this idea of establishing a godly community and what God actually will finish creating. The fact is God uses people. He uses people mm -hmm. to preach, to teach, to disciple. There's, there's nothing liberal or Unitarian or cultistic in, <laughs> in its very simple concept. It is a sort of hyper predestinarianism that says, if God wants to convert the heathen, he'll do it and do it without you. God has chosen to use people. And that's really comforting to think of missionary work in the context of this universal church that's through all ages and places and times. Oftentimes, I think when I hear, go to the four corners of the earth, it's like, I have to go to all four corners. And I mean, the earth has no corners. <laughs> but the fact is that you and I are parts of the body that is reaching the four corners. That's mm -hmm. not opposed to setting down roots and being part of a community. That's in fact, encouraging me to be the part of the church that is here in this corner of the earth. Hmm. There is a small distant land that I, I barely can pronounce the name of. I believe it's called Minamar. It's in uh, Southeast Asia. It's a, a small country. It's mostly Islamic insofar as it's anything, but there is a small Christian population there. One of our elders in his business travels got in touch with these people and they are so poor and they're beginning to suffer persecution and they they reached out to us and just said can you help us any anything any way can bibles in our language your pastor writes books could maybe you translate or could you get us just hand us one and we'll translate it yeah, that one on church government. Can you imagine this? A, a fledgling congregation on the far side of the earth wants a book on church government as one of their first <laughs> things. But that's what they wanted. They, they got it and they, they, they began publishing it. And we're helping to fund that. And we're praying for these people. Now, that's not the only way we can be involved, but it is a way. And it's it, our, our, our church... And I hope no one's offended, anyone from my church who may be listening, I hope it's not offended by this, but one thing we often say is that our small congregation's got two things. We've got sound theology, we got money. 
<laughs> Let's unite those <laughs> and support people who have other gifts and are doing other things. Uh, and, and we have tried. We've tried to look for places around the world where the money and the good theology can, can pay off. On, a, on another note, you know that I've written a little book on Revelation, which I'm going to plug later. <laughs> but uh, my publisher came and said, we know this guy in um, Brazil. We offered him in any of our books royalty free. He, he can just take one and, and go with it, run with it, publish and print it. And we showed him what we had. He picked your book on Revelation. So my book is now available in Portuguese. <laughs> A year or two later. Did you later, ever foresee that when you were writing it? No, I mean, <laughs> Portuguese. Well, that was nothing compared to the next one. Somewhere in India, and of course, India is a language of many dialects, some young man who had come to Christ in, in some kind of uh, Western organized evangelistic meeting somehow also got a hold of my book and said, This is the kind of thing I need. This is the gospel. Can I have permission to republish this and reprint this here? And again, my. Publisher said, "said Yeah, I guess. I'm, I'm sure the author will, but we don't." He, the young man said, "But we, we don't have the money." Publisher said, "We'll find the money." And so, between us all, somehow money happened. It didn't it? Wasn't a whole lot. <laughs> We're publishing in India, so my book is now available in English, Portuguese, and some Indian dialect whose name <laughs> I don't even know. And unfortunately, I can't read the book. I have a copy of it. <laughs> But since it's all in another dialect and another alphabet, I don't even know. <laughs> you can't what check dialect. up on their translation work. No, I have no, no idea what's going on here. Oh, I can't believe they translated this work like that. Yeah. <laughs> but this, this is the kind of mindset the church is supposed to have. We are not turned. We're not to be turned in on ourselves. Simply nurturing ourselves and building ourselves up so that we become more and more comfortable in who and what we are and what we've always done and the way we've always done it. But we're reaching out to new peoples who, and, and I think, Emily, you talked about this last time, who are going to bring with them their own ways of doing things, mm -hmm. perhaps their own music and their own rhythms and their own clothes and their own architectural styles. Some things will have to be left behind because they smack of idolatry, but the overwhelming most of it is just fine. And it will, we will again have the the rainbow effect of of different colors, shades, dimensions, facets of a glistening jewel. And so, do 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 we want community here? Yeah. What are the temptations of community? The temptations are to mistake it for eternity, mm -hmm. to think that what we've got is just fine and it can't be improved on. And closely related to that is the traditionalism that says. This is the way our church has done things for 300 years. Who are you to change it? <laughs> and I know there are Reformed churches of various stripes who bear certain nationalistic stamps from the old world, who continue to preach in, say, German or Dutch into the late 1800 or early 1900s, because that's the way they'd always done it. <laughs> And, and we can smile at that. Um, oh, my favorite example is this one. Um, there were some Germans, Lutheran Germans, about two centuries back, who wanted to evangelize in South America. And they found out that the Indians there did not speak German. Their solution was wonderful. We will go send them German teachers. Oh. And we will teach them German. <laughs> then we can go evangelize them. Hmm. Yeah, you smile, but it's the, the sad fact is they really did that. We hmm. we are so used yeah, to yeah. wanting things our way. One of the one of the wonders, and I've taken a number of groups of kids to to Europe, of of traveling and seeing the rest of the world is realizing the world doesn't do things the way you do, <laughs> and a lot of the times that's not only okay, it's actually a really great idea. <laughs> Americans visiting Italy for the first time is always fun. Oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. My my uh, oldest daughter, her first trip abroad was to was to Italy, and she could at least fake Italian. She'd had some um, couple of years of it, but yeah, it's no. We won't go there with all those stories. Okay. <sighs> That's so, good because I don't have any. I haven't been right. abroad yet. <laughs> Um, but I feel very included in this conversation now that uh, we're not talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, but when we cut when we reach the New Jerusalem, it is a city of immense size that holds a population 
that no man could number of every nation, people, kindred, and tongue. It's it's an incredibly beautiful thing in its diversity, in its glory, and in its unity. Way back at the beginning of this series, we were talking about the unity and diversity that is the personal triune God. We should not be any great surprise that when he would image himself in his bride, that he would also create unity and diversity at an incredibly beautiful level, all the way across mm -hmm. the board. Personality type, uh, physical type, description, culture, language, art, music, architecture, all the other things that come to mind. And, and so as Christians beginning community, we need to embrace differences but they need to be unified in terms of God's word. And here's here's where the challenge in our generation is. Accept everybody just as they are. Don't ask anybody to change. Love means total acceptance of all people and under all conditions right now as they are. Don't you dare criticize or you're not loving. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says no. That's <laughs> not at all how God loves us. <laughs> it's not it's also not us. even something they can hold to consistently because the minute you go against that particular social moray, <laughs> they will immediately condemn you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and we embrace everybody except you people. <laughs> uh, you don't embrace everyone. Those. Monsters. Yeah, monsters. Hate. Hate mongers. Nazis. Yes. We've heard it all. Um, and, and yet when it comes down to actually loving in a practical way of giving somebody a cup of cold water or pulling their ox out of a ditch, we... We Christians should be the first there, even if the person that we're doing it for is someone who, by the laws of God, probably should be imprisoned or executed. And yet, if the courts haven't touched them, they are still there as objects of charity and kindness, and they need to hear the gospel. Mm -hmm. And we need not to despise them and and abuse them with our words. We mm -hmm. need to simply point out what, what to them would seem abuse, perhaps. You're sinners. You're the image of God and you've broken it. But God has a way of salvation. He has a way of wholeness. And we can take that stand and we can be winsome, loving, kind people, firm in our convictions, firm in terms of God's word, because it's God's word, not our opinion. Our opinions mm -hmm. are not worth anything. Whereas the world, as it claims acceptance, keeps running into all kinds of, of situations where it can't accept. We, we, we accept everybody but you and you mm -hmm. and you. Uh, and it very quickly proves itself a charade. It's not. It's not real. It's not deep, and it's not giving. It does not. Uh, people will not go out of their way. They will not give of their own goods. My 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 girls love um, the song uh, "We Are the World," which was put together by all kinds of um, musical artists to raise funds for AIDS in Africa. If I remember correctly, it's a great idea. The songs. Mostly pretty good. <laughs> uh, I, it's amazing how many times I, I heard it without listening to it. But, you know, these, these, these people did this one thing, and then they were mostly done. They had a flash in the pan, heartfelt reaction to the sufferings of the world, and they did something once. Well, that's good, and we should commend them for having mm -hmm. done something good once. We should not say, well, it doesn't count because you only did it once. But we should insist that Christianity is a demanding faith that tells us we have to always be dying to self mm. for the life of the world. That's what mm -hmm. Jesus did. And although we are not him and we can't pay for the sins of the world, we are channels of his word and grace. We're, we're witnesses of his gospel. And that's going to cost. That's going to hurt. It hurts to be light in the midst of darkness. And just, just before I, I leave that subject, um, one, of the, one of the lines in the song, We Are the World, God has showed us by changing stones to bread. I don't know how many times oh, I oh. heard that without realizing what it actually oh. said. Yeah, That's the first like person the is a little little page a day <laughs> scripture quote calendar full of inspirational quotes that says, "Come worship me, and all the kingdoms of the world shall be yours." Yeah, <laughs> I don't think it means the same thing in context. <laughs> no, no, uh, it was Satan's idea for Jesus yeah. to change stones to bread once. After that, he didn't care because at that point he would have won. Mm. And so the world can offer all kinds of things that sound good that seem like they're humanitarian, that seem like they're loving, 
if we're not willing to pursue, well, how is this going to work out over the next 10 years, 20 years, 100 years in this nation, in the next nation, mm. in international relationships? How is this going to work? And if we don't, if we can't stand on God's word and say, well, God has says this is universal and this is always going to work, then we're left again with our own opinions of what we think is good for the world. And that's always scary. When people come and say, I'm going to do you good. Watch me. No, I have no rules or standards except those that I'm making up as we go, but it'll be fine. Yeah, that's when we run like everything. Yeah. Yeah. But, oh my. yeah. but God is the wonderful architect, the builder and maker of that city. Mm. And Abraham felt he could have complete faith in that architect. Yeah, after all, he's the creator of the world who that would helps. himself provide the sacrifice for sins. Amen. And I'm going to guess we're close to recommendations. Yes. Brian, what do you think is good for the world? Uh, <laughs> quite a lot of things, actually. Um, but none that are coming to mind at the moment. Somebody else go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to go ahead and recommend my little booklet on Revelation. And I, I do this for a couple of reasons. One, uh, I opened an, an envelope from my publisher just about two days ago. And I was expecting, he, he told me that, he, that we didn't have many books left and they weren't really going to sell. So he was just going to send them to me. And I've been waiting for them. What showed up and said was a check. My first royalty check after something like 10 or 15 years <laughs> for these books, my original deal with Jerry Congratulations. Mertz. Yeah. It's, it's, the issue is not the money. The issue is that it means he finally broke even with them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, was a, that was our original deal. I said, I don't care. I don't want any money off this. I just want to have about... Because the, the book existed in a self-published thing. I thought, I just want mm -hmm. a nice copy I can give to my kids and to some of my students and some friends. So if you can give me about 20, 30 copies, paper bound, you, any money you make, you can have. Say, oh, no, I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just have the money until we actually break even. Well, apparently we finally <laughs> did, which yeah. means that he's not sending me the rest, which means they're still there. So that for one, but there's something else because the last couple chapters in the book are about the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. It doesn't say everything it can be said by a long shot, but for those of you who are interested in pursuing the biblical imagery that reaches from the garden in Genesis to the new Jerusalem in the book of Revelation, this could be a good thing. It's a devotional sort of commentary. It doesn't mean it's theologically sloppy. It's just really fast and precise. But for people, I, I started this when f f I kept getting the request, do you, have a, do you have something on Revelation I can read in about two hours? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, there isn't any. But now so there is. Now, now there is. So um, Nordskog Publishing, it's available, available on Amazon. It's also available as an ebook, I believe. So come Great. on down. First come, first serve until they run out. <laughs> cool. We'll Next. put a link to that in our show notes. Thank you. All right. I do have something now. Yes. Cool. This might be something I end up recommending multiple times throughout the course of the podcast, and that is capitalism. Um, hey. I had a small. What, you don't like bread lines? Meeting. I actually, I love bread. If I could <laughs> set up a line of bread in my kitchen, that'd be good. Um, but I had a small, whimsical need. Uh, I had ordered a fountain pen online. And I did not have any bottles of ink to actually fill it with. And so I went on Amazon and I found a bottle of ink and I ordered it. And within three days, it was at my doorstep. And Man, I love capitalism. It's so great. It was a, it's yeah. a whimsical nothing. I, it, we're in the, <laughs> when this weird pandemic time and, you know, people can't get life-saving things and I'm able to get some random ink because... Well, maybe that's the problem. Your bottle of ink has killed three people, Brian. How do you feel? Oh, no. I feel horrible. <laughs> but yeah, that would, that's probably my recommendation uh, for this time and maybe multiple yeah. times Capital after today. Yeah. I think capitalism I bet, is a wonderful yeah. thing to recommend. I don't think Venezuela has any personal protective equipment or bottles of ink. So <laughs> That's true. Good reco. I'm going to recommend several facets of something. First, small business. If you are in a place to help keep a small business afloat, they're probably struggling right now. So if you have a little extra money to chuck their way, I'm sure they would appreciate it. Buying gift cards is great if the business isn't open like a small restaurant or something. 
My favorite small business that I'm going to encourage you to support is Valiant Coffee. Um, They're a little roastery out of Loomis, California. I actually know one of the founders. He's a Christian. And a lot of times when I recommend something that's by someone I know or a Christian, I I really want to clarify. It's not just because I know them and it's not just because they're a Christian. It's actually a good product. Um, (laughs) It's very much the case with Valiant Coffee. I have a subscription with them. So they send me beans when I've run out of coffee beans. Uh, Really excellent specialty coffee, a lot of variety and good stuff. The third facet of this recommendation is Stroopwafel. You've probably seen those little Dutch cookies that are like caramel and wafers. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that what you do with those is you put them on top of your mug of hot coffee and the coffee steam melts the caramel. And you get like an extra good caramel cookie that's all melty and nice. It's so, delicious. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of trivial, but you have to look for the little pleasures in life in times like these. So, And I would like to pull your two recommendations together and make an observation. Because Brian is recommending capitalism to a lot of people that is hard and cold and impersonal and mechanical. Whereas Emily is talking about something she knows and loves and enjoys and is trying to get you to buy it. The, the the thing here is that Emily is not advocating for laws that will make you buy it right. or will that will keep this business afloat. She is using her own winsome personality to try and her knowledge of oh, well, thank you very to much. try to <laughs> persuade you to freely spend your money mm-hmm. there in return for what will be a good product. And if you are persuaded and you go and you find this is indeed a good product, then they win and you win. If on the other hand, Emily has misrepresented this this product and you find that her tastes are not up to your high standards, well, then she loses and she will be more careful in the future because she wants to maintain her reputation uh, as a, a coffee advocate, I guess. While Brian sits <laughs> back and watches all the things click into place because this is indeed is exactly what capitalism is. Uh, we have to analyze it impersonally, but it only exists in persons. Mm-hmm. And, and free voluntary exchanges. Free voluntary exchanges. You can hype it up all you want, but at the end of the day, people still have to decide for themselves that they're going to see through the hype and still buy it anyway. Mm-hmm. So this is this is something worth recommending many times, Brian, as we go along. <laughs> cool. I'll, I'll make a note to do that periodically. <laughs> yeah. Every once in a while, just recommend capitalism. This is your monthly reminder. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Since Brian brought up translations today, he mentioned the ESV. I'm just going to throw out a clarification about our show notes. Typically, when we read the Bible on the show, at least when Greg or I read the Bible on the show, it's in the King James because that's what we personally use. And there are reasons for that that maybe we can talk about if someone's curious. But when I link Bible chapters in the show notes, I do it in the ESV. And I'll tell you why. The ESV has a beautiful user-friendly website. The King James, not so much. (laughs) Um, So that's why, in case you were wondering why I was linking the ESV. Speaking of our show notes, um, some people have had trouble finding them, so I'm going to tell you where to find them. (laughs) Uh, If you go to our Anchor homepage, that's anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion, you do have to do this on your computer, not on your phone. I discovered this today. I was Uh helping one of our listeners, by the way, podcast secret. If you ever hear somebody say one of our listeners and they don't say like Dave from Nebraska, they're talking about their mother. So I was talking about, (laughs) I was talking with my mother today about where to find our show notes. So you go to our homepage, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion, and it'll list all of the episodes and then it'll be a little read more gray dot with an ellipsis inside. Um, And you click on those and that's where all the links are. Show notes are also in the description in YouTube on each week's post on Facebook or in your podcast catcher. Speaking of our Anchor homepage, you will find a support button there. If you would like to give a recurring monthly donation to help us keep this show running, you can do that there. Uh, You can also give us a one-time gift at PayPal. That's paypal.me slash halting towards Zion. Gifts are much appreciated. Um, You can also support us by buying books that we recommend on Amazon in our show notes. Check out our transcripts if you prefer to read podcasts. Send us an email with any questions or comments or feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Like our Facebook page. Thanks so much for listening. See you next week.